It has been nice in this past week as we start to see the change of the season, um, as we start to recognize as, uh, as the temperatures are falling, as the, uh, uh, it's a much welcome moment after the, the hot summer that we had uh, over this past year. Uh, it is such a welcome thing. In fact, I have had a campfire with s'mores uh, twice in the past week. Um, it, is, uh, it is one of those things that uh, I don't normally get to have all that often, and yet it has happened twice in the last week. Um, we start to begin to break out the... Um, start to begin to break out the warmer clothes uh, this time of year. And uh, with breaking out the, the warmer clothes, the cl clothes that have been put away since last year, uh, comes the opportunity to discover things that were hidden in the pockets uh, from the previous year. Um, sometimes, maybe you've, maybe you've encountered this before yourself, but you uh, pull out the, the coat and you discover cash is in the pocket. Has that ever happened to you before? Uh, it is a wonderful experience, although I fear that that experience is going to occur less and less as we move into a world where we don't use cash all that often uh, anymore, but you know, so be it, I guess. Um, but it is a good feeling when you discover something that was misplaced, when you discover something that was lost, um, it is a common occurrence in my house, since I have two kids, um, that we are constantly looking for things that were misplaced, uh, whether that is a water bottle or a ring or some headphones or a jacket or one of the two shoes um, that should be on your feet. Uh, we are always looking for something. And it's not just kids, of course. I lose things, too. Um, I have, um, years ago, I've mentioned this before, but years ago, I misplaced one of my favorite, my very favorite fountain pens, um, and I, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of expensive uh, for a pen, and so I was uh, kind of upset about uh, not knowing where it was, and it was missing for like a year and a half uh, before I discovered it tucked away uh, in the trunk of my wife's car uh, in the car's manual. I got it out to look up something, and lo and behold, I don't know how that happened or how it got there, but I couldn't wait to tell her about it, that I had found my lost pen. Um, it is, and de depending on what it is that is lost, um, it affects how strong the emotions are behind it, right? And so the more valuable, whether valuable objectively or just to us, the more valuable something is, we, when it is lost, we go into a deep disappointment at the very least about it. Um, and when it is found, we experience the other end of the spectrum, the extreme, in having the high of excitement in finding it. Jesus knew this feeling very well. He knew that we experience the, the lows of disappointment in losing something and the highs of excitement in finding it. And he knows that that feeling resonates with us. And so he told several stories around things that were lost and the joy that, was, that resulted when they were found. Uh, today and next week, we are going to take a look in a two-part series, just two parts in this series. We're going to take a look at probably the most famous of the stories that Jesus talks about, something lost and something found, a story that is commonly known as the prodigal son. Um, it's a story that I don't think I ever really get tired of, and it's a story that I promise you as we go through it, even if you've heard it a hundred times before, I find that it always has, this story always has just exactly what someone needed to hear. And so I wonder if that will be you. And even if it doesn't resonate in that way, I guarantee that if you pay attention, you will find yourself somewhere in this story. You are somewhere in this story. And it is a story that starts like this. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And the father divided his property between the brothers. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. 
Uh, this is a story that begins with a bang. It begins in a way that those who were gathered around to hear Jesus tell this story, I think there would have been an audible gasp among the people. And I think that that would have happened several times through the telling of this story. It's just that kind of story, even if it is lost on us in some ways. But we see this uh, we see this, uh, this younger son come to his father and say something that is absolutely cold, absolutely cold-hearted in saying to his father, give me my inheritance. Give it to me now. It is in essence saying, I'm tired of waiting for you to die. Give me what I am owed now. It is a shameful request. It is a shameful request that everyone around would have said, this guy is wicked. He is straight up evil in asking this of his father. And it's not just um, that it's an offensive thing to ask. This is going to bring shame on the family name. How could he ever go to his father and say something like this? And perhaps even more shocking than the request is that the father gives it to him. The father could have responded in a number of ways. He could have disciplined the young man, and perhaps this is what the crowd would have expected, that maybe this is where the story was going, to say, can you believe someone like this? And the father disciplined him to teach him a lesson. That would have been a story that would have preached as well. But that's not what he does. Shockingly, he grants the request. And you have to wonder why would he do that? Why would he give him what he asks, what amounts to a third of the family estate? Because the father would give to the older son twice as much as the younger son, and so he gives two-thirds to the older and one-third to the younger. And if we understand the way that things worked correctly, it wouldn't have just been money. We're talking about uh, actual property, And so the son would need to then, after being given it, would need to liquidate the property, convert it into money, sell it off to someone else. And so part of the family land is now owned by someone else, another family, perhaps a a competitor in whatever business they ran. And so we see this son, um, and we think, how terrible. How could you do this to your father? But what we see in the father's response, strangely enough, is we're not supposed to just see how wasteful the son is, but how giving the father is. That he gives him enough to waste. And that's where I want to start as we begin to think about this story is that our father, if we're recognizing that the father in the story is our father in heaven, that our father is abundantly generous. Our father is abundantly generous. He gives. There's a subtlety in the Greek that gets a little bit lost in translation because there are two words, actually, that are being used for property. Uh, that gets translated as the one word property in this. What the son asks for is a word, usia, which means literally just just wealth, just, just the money, just give me the wealth. The word for the property that the father is said to give him is actually the Greek word bios, which is one of the Greek words for life. And so it, it, we would might, we, it's sort of a similar equivalent in the way that we might say things is, uh, is you ask me for money and I give you my livelihood. And you see there's a connection of life to what the father is giving to his son. He is giving him livelihood. The father, I think, when I ask the question, why does he do this? Why does he give it to him? I think the father kind of knows what's coming. And the father recognizes that his son, in the fact that he's asking for this, he's already gone. 
Like he's already emotionally, uh, spiritually checked out from this relationship. He is trying to leave. He's already gone. And so what can the father do by denying the request but just make him feel, feel more imprisoned? And so he gives him, out of his graciousness, he gives him life. And I think that what he is doing is investing in the son's future. We'll come back to that. But in this moment, he is giving a demonstration of grace, a demonstration of generosity that he has hopes will ultimately work to bring his son back. He is establishing this, and so I just want us to recognize that our God, our Father, is generous. Sometimes we can think otherwise about him. Sometimes we can think that our God is holding out on us. The world sort of trains us to think in this way, to think that our God is holding out on us, preventing us from accessing the good stuff in the world. And our culture calls to us, come over here. It's nice and enjoyable over here. And you can indulge in all the things that will bring you satisfaction. If you recall the story in the Garden of Eden, that's more or less the original message of temptation to Eve. Did God really say you can't eat all this fruit? God, God's really holding out on you. It's some good stuff and you should enjoy it. Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Your God's not holding out on you. In fact, Jesus says elsewhere in, in Matthew uh, 7, he's like, you know, you guys, you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children. Don't you know that your father who is good gives good gifts to those who ask him? James reminds us that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Our God is abundantly generous. No doubt the son in the story had witnessed the father's generosity. He had witnessed the way that his father treated um, his, his hired hands. He had witnessed the ways that he had always provided for him and his brother he knew the good nature of his father time and time again, and yet he became numb to it. He no longer recognized it because he became so used to it. And so he was allowed to begin to believe that he was missing out. Missing out on the good stuff. That real life was somewhere out there, outside of the oversight of his father, and he wanted to do what he needed to do to go and get it. And I can imagine that as he left home and as he went out and he spent that money in, as the scripture says, reckless living. I can imagine that for a while that feeling would have seemed confirmed. He would have felt like, yeah, I am living the good life. After moving from the rural areas out into Roman metropolitan life that was designed to be striking and overwhelming to show the power and the enjoyment of being a citizen of the Roman Empire. Moving into the far country and having access to amenities that simply didn't exist where he was from. Seeing the magnificent architecture all around him. Experience actually running water. Walking through the city and seeing a whole area just devoted to what you could buy. All sorts of fashion from all over the empire. Food that he had never heard of, that he was now smelling and having the opportunity to taste. Going in and experiencing the indulgence that surrounded the bathhouses and the brothels. And moment by moment... Having the feeling was, I was right. Now I am experiencing the high life. And I wonder how long that lasted. I wonder how long it takes to blow through a third of the father's entire estate. How long does the money 
last. But during all of that time, during all of that time, he's able to lose sight of the goodness and the generosity of his father. And so we see our father is abundantly generous. That's the truth. But we can be like the son in some ways and, rec- and see that the pr- our pride, selfish ambition can often blind us to his nature. Where we don't see his generosity, we don't see what he has given us, we don't appreciate it, and suddenly those gifts begin to spoil. That can be us. Even if not so extreme as it is in the story, we can start to indulge ourselves in the trappings of this world, maybe dipping our toe in a little at a time and saying, yeah, there's true enjoyment of life. All the while, we're moving further and further away, becoming disconnected from the source of life itself. And as we wander off into the far country, experiencing what we think in the moment is the good life, it grieves a God who loves us, who longs for better for us, who knows that he is better for us, and that true life is only found in him, and yet... It is our choice to turn away. There's so many passages like this, but uh, in Hosea 13, we see this is God speaking, lamenting the wanderings of his people and saying, I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. When I fed them, they were satisfied. But here's the twist. When they were satisfied, they became proud, and then they forgot me. Our comfort has a way, our indulgence has a way of drawing us away from the source of life. Of forgetting where all the good things come from. How can it be that we could forget the provider of the very things that we are enjoying? It's in pride. It's in self-focus. It is in entitlement. Now, the blessings that God gives us are, in many ways, intended to be enjoyed. He blesses us and wants us to enjoy the things that he blesses us with, but they aren't merely for our indulgence. God blesses us. He is generous towards us, but they are designed to also equip us for service to give us the resources we need to carry out the mission that he has placed in front of us. And so we have 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God blesses abundantly to equip you abundantly so that you can abound in every good work. Perhaps it's counterintuitive sometimes to see that applying God's blessings to serve rather than to indulge, to apply them to serve is more satisfying than simply indulging. Think of it this way, this might sound silly, but um, you could eat a whole pizza all by yourself and in some ways, that sounds kind of, uh, kind of enticing, a little indulgence. Eat a whole pizza by yourself, but if you share it with somebody, if you share it with someone, then you get to have the pizza and fellowship too. And so the blessing gets multiplied. Uh, that might be a silly example, but you see where I'm going. That as we apply the things that we are given, it multiplies into greater blessing, not just for us, but for those around us. Look also at Paul's instruction to Timothy. And Timothy was um, tasked with leading the church there in Ephesus. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. 
whatever God has blessed you with, out of his abundant generosity, whatever he's blessed you with, whether it's money, material things, or whether he's given you a particular set of skills or placed you in a place of influence or you have a certain level of knowledge or doors of opportunity are open before you, whatever he has blessed you with, I want to encourage you this morning to see that as an equipping for service, to turn those blessings outward and not just to receive blessing, but to be a blessing. Be a blessing. To return to the story, the son that received his inheritance early, he went out and he was reckless. He indulged and enjoyed to the last penny what he had. As extravagant as his father was at giving, he was equally extravagant with his selfish spending. Until the inevitable happened. And we're told in verse 14, when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So that he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. And so we have someone going from the high life of indulgence to falling all the way down to hit rock bottom. Sometimes that's what it takes. We understand that from a Jewish perspective, the pigs were filthy. They were unclean. They were off limits because they made you unclean. Not just to eat them, but to be around them and to touch them, much less to to care for them and feed them. And yet, desperation has led to this. He said in the beginning, his request to his father was shameful. And now he is experiencing ultimate shame and where it has led him to. He has nothing left. And the real kicker, I think, comes in the, the last phrase of what's on the screen. No one gave him anything. No one cared. Nobody cared that he had hit rock bottom. Nobody he was around that he had squandered all of his money with. Nobody cared. The people that he was around valued unclean pigs more than him. They would feed the pigs, but they wouldn't feed him. So he longed for what the pigs had. He saw that the unclean pigs had a better life than he did. And this is in stark contrast, as we said, to the generosity of the father who gave to him. Now we see a world that the son gave himself to. And that world gave him nothing in return. The world does not care for us the way that our father does. The sooner we recognize that, the better. The world does not care for us the way our Father does, and its indulgent promises, they might be fun for a little while, but they will inevitably fail us. They will come up short. We can be deceived about what this world offers to us. We can believe that the world offers us enjoyment, ultimate enjoyment in the indulgence that it leads us to. That it offers us acceptance into some kind of connection. That it offers us happiness to experience. And while all of those things, as I said, they might be true for a short time, inevitably they will run out because because it is an illusion that is masking something that hides underneath. There is an evil in this world that is there that we don't always recognize, that we don't always notice is lurking below the surface. But remember, we've talked about this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion lion looking for someone to devour. You are nothing to him but something to be consumed. He doesn't want, he doesn't care about your enjoyment. He'll give it to you for a time as a way to entrap you. 
He doesn't want your happiness. He wants to consume you. And there are times, as I said, it, it, it lurks below the surface, it is masked, but there are times that we, we get to see or have to be forced to see that wickedness coming to the surface. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but it's all around us. It's bubbling up. It is bubbling up. There is so much evil and wicked in this world. I mean, I, I, was, I was struck, you know, last year um, in ways when, when um, Russia was invading Ukraine. And as that continues to this day. And hearing the stories coming out of that and the, the, the wickedness of, of what people were doing over there to other people. And it was disturbing. And now, just in the, in the last um, week or so, we've seen uh, other war breaking out in, in Israel, in the Gaza Strip, and we see, you, you hear the stories of, of the horror that goes on there, what people are willing to do to other people. It's horrifying. And not just in the killing, but in the, the way that they treat people and talk about people. It's, it's awful. It's wicked. And it's woven through our own culture. It's not just wars overseas. We see corruption emerging as the masks come off, as we see it in, uh, in our political system, as we see it in our entertainment industry, as people are coming to the service, even among uh, religious organizations, and we see wickedness being exposed. I was reflecting on this the other day, and I could not help but tears were coming to my eyes, and I, I couldn't help but all I could say was, Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. This evil needs to be dealt with and destroyed. We're ready for a, for a new world. That that's the way the world is. That is the, what this world has to offer. That's what we're being called into. Amen. That's the face behind it. That's the man behind the curtain. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 19, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. He also said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief, your enemy, the devil, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Which one do you want to pledge your allegiance to? Which one do you want to serve? Which one gives you joy for eternity rather than a momentary joy followed by destruction? If you want true life, if you want true abundance, if you want true joy, if you want true meaning in your life, then store up your treasure in the Father's house. Put your life in the hands of the source, the giver of life. And so to return to our story, a son who has wandered into a far land and spent his inheritance on reckless living and hit rock bottom. How long are we to imagine that the son in this story is away from home? How long does it take for all of these things to happen? How long do the good times last? How long did he spend with the pigs? Months? Years? How long does it take for pride to finally break down? I notice that in the story, when the money runs out, his immediate response isn't to go back home. His immediate response is to try to find a, find a way to make this work, continue to hold on to being in the far country. How long did he pridefully keep going? Is it in any way, is it in any way keeping any part of you from the Father? How long does it take for your pride to break down? How long does it keep you away? How long will you wander in the far country? How long? For the son in the story, eventually, enough was enough. And finally, maybe inevitably, it says he came to himself. He woke up. He came to his senses, 
And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Finally, it occurred to him. Finally, it dawned on him that all this glittering world had done was take from him. And in that contrast, he remembered the generosity, the generous nature of his father. He saw, maybe for the first time, appreciated how he'd always been taken care of in his father's house. And he remembered that even the hired servants were well treated. And maybe he had never been a hired servant before. And he assumed that that's just the way they were treated. And now he was one to someone that didn't care for him. Whatever the case, it all came crashing down on him. And he made the resolve to return home. He started thinking about what he would say, and he really becomes a beautiful example for us of what repentance means, what repentance looks like. As we wake up to the reality of sin in our lives and the harm that it causes, it should drive us to humble repentance. The son begins to develop his speech. What's he going to say? Notice that as he develops that, he's saying, I've, I've sinned. I, I, I admit it, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm not worthy. Just treat me as one of your servants. His appeal has no, has no selfishness to it. It's not an appeal to his, his worthiness. It is an appeal to the nature of his father. Appeals to the generosity of his father. Um. The pride that had driven him from his father has now been purged by hitting rock bottom. He humbles himself. Can you imagine how hard that was? How hard it would be to actually do that. But he experiences a depth of conviction. A pain in his heart, a godly grief washes over him the results of his sin And that drives him to repentance. That is to choose a new path, to choose a different direction. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in the first Corinthian letter, he had some difficult things to say. And uh, apparently a lot of it upset them and hurt their feelings. And when he wrote them again in second Corinthians, he, he starts to tell them how he was he didn't he heard that the, that it had hurt their hurt them in some way and he had begun to regret it but now he didn't regret it because it had resulted in them repenting and he says this in uh, 2 Corinthians 7:9 he says as it is i rejoice not because you were grieved but because you were grieved into repenting for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. He's saying this is, we're not intended to just be saddled with a weight of guilt that we can't get rid of. We're not intended to just be guilty and carry that, that around like a sack of bricks for the rest of our lives. But we should be confronted with the grief of our own sin recognizing that it's not just taboo things that are off limits that we wish we could enjoy, but that it is destructive behavior that hurts us and hurts other people. And when confronted with that grief, it should drive us into the healing arms of God to relieve us of that guilt. And I think that this, this, as I said, uh, in the beginning of the story, the father was investing in the future of his son. I think this is what what we're talking about. This is the outcome that the father was hoping for and investing in when he demonstrated his generosity towards the son in the beginning. Look what Paul says in Romans 2. He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 
His kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, not to endorse the things that you're doing, but to recognize so that you recognize who he is and are drawn to him and you see the contrast of his kindness and goodness and graciousness with the way that you are. And you're drawn to him to be healed. And so this morning, know, believe in the goodness and graciousness of your God. Know that you are not, I don't know how far into the far country you've wandered, but know that you are not too far to turn back to him. Amen. You are not too far. And, and, and the son in the story also sets an example for us. We recognize it's not just a thought that he has, I should really return home. He gets up and he goes. He takes steps of faith, steps of action in the direction of the father. And you can imagine as he makes that journey home, I don't know how far away the far country was, but as he makes the, the, uh, the journey back home, imagine him going down the road, rehearsing those lines of what he would say to the father when he saw him. Imagine him wondering what kind of reception he would receive if he would receive one at all. Maybe there would be moments along the way where he had the thought, you know what, this is too much, maybe I should just uh, turn back. But he keeps going. And when he gets there, he's still dirty, still hungry, still smells like pigs, perhaps weak, wondering, am I going to be turned away on sight? And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Again, how long had it been? How, how many months or years had it been that the son had been away with no message back home to let him know what was going on? How long had it been? And yet we discover that the father had been patiently waiting in hope for this day. It says that while the son was still a long way off, I think it's interesting that the word that is used there for a long way off is the same word that is used when it says that he went to a far country. While he is still in some way, in some way he is still far away. He is still a long way off. He is still in the, the zone where he went to, but he's making his way back. He's turned toward the father, and while he is still over there, the father didn't wait for him to come any further. The father went to him, running no less, throwing caution to the wind. Who cares about what anybody thinks about me? I am running, even if it looks undignified. And I'm reminded that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in the far country, our God was pointed toward us, seeking us. And while he's still covered with the dirt of feeding the pigs, we recognize that the Father is going to him, not waiting for him to get cleaned up first. It's not about get your things sorted out, wash everything off, and then come to me. He goes to him. The word prodigal is often applied to the son. Prodigal, if you didn't know, prodigal means extravagant, excessive, over the top. Um, Tim Keller once said, he wrote a book about this, saying that really um, it's about the prodigal God. The God who is extravagant, who goes over the top. And I kind of like that image. I think this is a prodigal family. We'll get to that. 
but it reminds us in no uncertain terms that you can return, that the Father wants you to return so badly. And so the final point this morning is that we can trust as we recognize where we may be in our sins, we can recognize that we have a father who has unfailing love. Unfailing. And we know that his grace is restorative as we turn to him. When the son makes it back, he can't even finish his rehearsed speech. He doesn't get halfway through the speech and the father cuts him off and starts calling for them to bring out the robe and the ring and the sandals and start preparing the feast. And all of that is not about just more indulgence just now at the father's house. He is demonstrating complete restoration of his son. The son who had effectively divorced his family is now restored to full son status. When you come to Christ, or when you return to Christ, it means full, immediate restoration with God. There's no probationary period. There's not a, like, just a little time to, to get your matters sorted out and see if you really want to do this. It is if you come to him, you are in the family, period. All the way. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to pay back your debt. You're in. As we saw in Ephesians, when we studied the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verse 4, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. John reminds us, 1 John 1, 9, that if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As John says, this is who he is. He is faithful. Even though we are not, even when we are unfaithful, he is faithful. His desire is to bring us to himself. Remember this about our God. His desire is to bring us to himself, not to keep us away at all costs. He wants us with him. He's not looking for, he, he's not looking for loopholes to keep you away from him. If anything, he's looking for any way to bring you to him. That's the God that we serve. And so Jesus gives us this glorious story of repentance, of forgiveness of reconciliation and so much needed hope but it's not the end of the story it's not the end of the story the story began as this was a man who had two sons and so next week we're going to talk about the other son the other half of this story until then May we know and may we believe and may we trust in the prodigal love, in the prodigal generosity of our Father. May we see the world for what it is in its destructive indulgence. May we humbly return to our prodigal God no matter how far we have wandered. And may we enjoy the celebration of heaven in our full restoration. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to read another verse, and we're going to sing a song. And uh, during that song, I'll be at the back of the room with, uh, with the elders. And if you have any needs at all, if you want somebody to pray with, if you're ready to be baptized and begin walking the path of a new life, uh, we'd love to do that today. If you just have anything you want to talk about at all, that's what we'll be back there for. Uh, but let's conclude with these verses here. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. If we can help.